Hello and welcome to the Move Your Business Forward podcast. These talks are hosted by Rob Bowl, founder of Evoke Management and CEO of International Leaders UK. We'll be talking with experts from both these companies about issues that affect SME companies today. Welcome to this um, edition of the Move Your Business Forward podcast. Um, today we're talking about uh, certain things around the big squeeze. Um, lots of companies are facing big challenges at the moment. And today I'm joined by two of my colleagues who are experienced finance directors, and we're going to share some thoughts and ideas around that. So I'm really pleased to have today Phil and Colin joining us, um, not to be mistaken for Phil Collins joining us today, but Phil and Colin. So welcome both. It's good to have you here. One of the first topics I'm going to talk about in this in this um, series is cash flow management. I think every SME business and every big business comes to come to think of it, and the, and the country as a whole um, is, is challenged with cash flow management right now. And what I want to do is just share some thoughts and ideas as to how companies can really help themselves um, from your experience as, as, as running companies and being experienced finance directors, what kind of things companies can do to help with, with cash flow management. Got in, what, what springs to your mind first off when it comes to cash flow management? And obviously, thanks for being here today. I'll be first, like, um, proper startup land, that's Shoreditch Church behind me, so this really is a startup theme. Um, <laughs> cash flow management, well, if you'd asked me that 18 months ago, I'd have said it was an absolute cinch because it was COVID times and you just lean on the government, the, the PAYE, VAT, bounce back loans, it was easy. Those days are long and true, they're, they're long gone, they're, they are they are over. The, there's a new VAT regime in place, it's really difficult to mess around with the VAT now, PAYE likewise, they're really reining in what you can do. Um, typically, if you want to get money from HMRC, you're looking at a loan of about six months payback, really good interest rate. If you can avoid the fines, which you probably can, so long as you keep the dialogue going with them, HMRC is still a really good short source of short-term funds. Just make sure you phone them on the day of the deadline. Um, give them a story that is actually true rather than just giving a lot of old nonsense because in a month's time they'll put you on a six monthly direct debit in a month's time if you're abusing the direct debit and you're, you're caught out they're going to throw the towel dustbin hold on at you so so be careful on that but setting up short-term cash with hmrc right now not as easy as it was but still so it's okay it's fine six months cool and in terms of just just what you um are going to present to um either HMRC or anyone else. I mean, and we're talking about companies, not necessarily just startups but more established companies where just things have become tight. Um, anything else that you would make sure is... Well, 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 I mean, great, question one from HMRC is, is that the HMRC should be the, the last resort. So you've got to tell them what else you've done to try and find short-term cash. Um, so are the sources of short-term cash would, I mean, fundamentally... Um, it's not a bank overdraft. They just don't exist these days. I mean, it's a, you might get a temporary one for a few thousand because you've made a mistake on paying a supplier too early. So I'd almost say don't bother phoning the bank. That's just wasting the time. Um, invoice factoring, still very good. Um, they, they are There are a lot more players out there. Um, uh, more international. So historically, they've said, you know, look at your, your receivables list and they so it's not blue chip British companies. Now they're getting much more amenable. Um, so factoring is still very good. The, the, the question a lot of people will obviously immediately ask is tell us tell us about your directors. If you've got rich directors, I want personal guarantees. Personally, I would just stop the conversation there. I wouldn't go there. If you get to the level of personal guarantees, then the directors themselves must have just put the money in themselves. I mean, it doesn't really achieve anything if you've got a PG. So I certainly wouldn't do that. R and D tax credit loans, and if you're in the world of R and D tax credits, they're they're Again, a lot more players out there. Three or four years ago, there was hardly anybody doing it. Um, Rocking Horse Group, if you've come across them, they're probably one of the first. They're, they're very good. I've used them a few times. Um, R&D tax credit loans, that's low-hanging fruit. You basically, they will advance you money. And when the R&D tax credit loan is repaid, it goes back to the lender. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what they're lending these days. I would guess like 60, 70% of, of your R&D tax credit claim. They're not going to give you 100% because HMRC might kick back and you're not going to get the full amount of the claim. So, yeah, R&D tax rate loans, they're very good. Um, I'm not really in the world of inventory, but inventory, if you've got some sort of stock that you can secure against, 
um, that that is always a useful thing to do. But you're not going to get a lot from that. Not well, not in my SME world. You're not in a big company. You might. Um, but apart from that, any assets you've got in the business, any fixed assets, uh, just assume they're worthless. I mean, you, you know, no one's going to lend against a bunch of fixed assets. You know, PCs, a second-hand PC, it's, it's worthless, isn't it? Um, so, so, so back in the day, you know, you could secure against random fixed asset register stuff. Kind of, unless you're a really niche company with something special, I wouldn't go there. Certainly, any manufacturing equipment, it's probably too difficult to move it. Of course, the lender's just thinking, you know, if you default on the loan, I'm going to end up with this asset. Do I want it? And the answer is probably no. <laughs> too difficult to move. It's too bespoke. Can't flog it. So, so fixed assets, unless you, you've got something really special about your company, something different, I kind of wouldn't go there. Uh, and of course, the, you know, the ultimate short-term port of call is, is your shareholders. Um, yeah. and, and actually, I mean, I use them a lot myself. I mean, I really am in the startup world. I, I do like, you know, someone with an idea. Uh, and the shelves have already put some money in. Um, and they're surprisingly amenable. I mean, typically, I would say, given, you know, 1% interest a month, um, secure it over something. Um, and, and you know, if, they, if they're sort of you know, wealthy enough or dumb enough <laughs> to invest in your business, they've probably got a little bit spare, spare cash that they've got in a bank account earning 3% interest or something like that. And they you know, it's not just keen to help out. They might actually see an opportunity for themselves to earn a bit of interest out of you. So, I, I, I mean, in my experience, far too much people ignore their shareholders and the shareholders actually, you know, both want you to succeed and, you know, they've probably got a bit of cash. Might even have a bit of surplus cash. And, you know, they, you know it just, it's not, we're not seeing, talking long-term loans here, you know, three, six months, and they'll lend you a bit of cash. 1% but, in, 1 Colin, interest I think, a month. I think, well, I think there's lots of ideas there to, to, to think about how to, to source additional funding and, and some people won't have think thought of those. So I think that's really, um, really useful. And and Phil, just before we I bring you into this, I don't know if you've got any any further thoughts as to what Colin's, Colin's mentioned there. Um, I think but, that, yeah. I mean, I was going to say to me, when, when you said kind of cash flow management for me, it would be a lot of this SMEs that I to kind of come into contact with, uh there is that uh, a little bit of a both i say advanced planning in terms of having a little bit more foresight to plan for the future and not shoving your head in the sand that you uh yeah you, everyone has a wonderful financial uh forecast model that would indicate that their sales are going to grow by 25 percent month on month year on year and reality is that things like that don't tend to transpire so for me i would be looking at uh what what kind of model have you got in place at the moment how far does that go in the future and then how much uh capacity how much stretch have you got within that because the thing a lot of it is basically planning in advance i mean i think all of the things that colin's mentioned yeah they're ideal for basically sources you know some of that a few that i'm maybe not if i'm going to steal because i'm not i'm not familiar with particularly the r d loans thing um i mean i've claimed for an r d but those kind of things are great it's more a question of a lot of the, the the smes that i work with it's like they haven't they haven't got that forward plan to be able to 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 base it on and therefore whether it's whether it's uh that and or the fact that they're not being realistic about what they're they're going to be able to achieve i think that's the starting point for me in terms of once you've done that then yes it then becomes a you know you have you know there are conversations to be had about or well, where can you get short term i mean i agree about the bank overdraft it seems very difficult to be able to get anything out of a bank unless you're going to provide you know you know guarantees overdrafts or you know overdrafts or loans but um i think definitely that model having that in place and having a certain amount of flex within it to understand what is the future i think that's a starting point for me Sure. And, and thank you, Phil, for sharing those those thoughts. So one, one thing that occurs to me is obviously a startup, early stage company, day one, you've got a cash flow issue because you well, you always started with nothing or very limited funds. For a more established company, I always think um, it's not necessarily a cash flow issue. It's really the fact that something hasn't happened to get to where you are. So the sales you're planning haven't come through. You've spent too much on staff and, and other overheads. So often the cash, the cash flow challenge is the result of something not going to plan in the first place. So I wonder if we can just share some thoughts as to how to avoid getting into that scenario. And I understand for some companies that the day one they've got a cash flow challenge because they're trying to bootstrap a startup. But for a more established company, 
that's trying to prevent themselves getting into a cash flow challenge, what are the things you would be suggesting they're looking at, Colin, to making sure? And this is ideal world because we're, we're in uncertain times and challenges, but what would you suggest? I'd go back to Phil's point about um, forecasting. I, I mean, forecasts are, I, I don't know, not, not what the paper they're written on. And I think people believe their own hype that you're going around raising money in the outside world and you, you begin to believe the story that you're telling that is going to be an optimistic story of course it is because you're trying to raise money but don't fall for your own hype you've got to be you almost got to run run, run two two models <laughs> the, the optimistic one and, and the pessimistic one and you, you've got to work for the pessimistic one uh, you, you're not going to make your targets as quickly as you think you're going to make them you're not going to employ salespeople at a stellar and going to immediately hit the ground running and sell stuff um so i mean forecasting of course is absolutely crucial when you you know, people do generally fall foul of either not forecasting or not forecasting pessimistically enough. So, yeah, I mean, stay on your job with your forecast and, and, and yeah, you know, try and buy a software tool to do it for you. Yeah. Back of a fag packet, Excel, it's all very well, but it's, it's you know, there, there are plenty of tools out there, Fathom, Futurely, whatever. I mean, there are loads out there. Try and automate so that you can't make errors in your in your logic. You can make errors in your optimism but for God's sake, don't make errors in your in, in your in your Excel forecasting. Yeah. Um, I, it's only my experience. The vast majority of people don't make their forecasts, which they just don't. Um, yeah, I, they, I, love I, their, they, they, they love their they come they love their companies too much, don't they? That's the problem. Well, I think the tool set that that the yeah the the having a a best and worst case scenario and 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 planning certainly for the worst case scenario. The tool sets I think is another great area. There's so many goods technology tool sets out there you know from obviously just managing your day-to-day -day finances and something like zero is fine but then for forecasting ahead generally there are better tool sets out there for that type of thing and, and uh, as colin says the worst thing you can do is basically base it on a fag packet and then other than you lose the fag packet or if you do it on zero the equivalent of basically misplacing one of your cells to suddenly find that you know your your, your for, for future forecast is not maybe quite as robust as what you once thought, thought it was yeah, I think with forecasting as well, it's like anything, the more you do it, the more you look at it, the better you get at it as well. So if you start doing forecasting and look at it regularly and, and ideally look at it with with someone in finance that's in tune with what it should look like, a, a, a finance director ideally. But the more you look at it, the more you question it, the more you say, OK, why were we not hitting that forecast or why are we off the forecast? The better and better the whole team will get at looking at it and, and making a better forecast. And I think, yeah, saying a positive, optimistic outlook to a potential investor is, is exactly what, what you should really be doing because that's what you're selling. You're selling that kind of dream. But yeah, for running the business day to day, you really do have to be realistic and making sure you're not just going to run out of cash because you've just been too optimistic and too unrealistic. So just, just circling back, I mean, just, and the whole purpose of this was just talk about some top tips around cash flow management. So Colin, if you were going to advise a business owner listening to this to do one thing what would be your top tip regarding cash flow management you would encourage them to do and be pessimistic would be <laughs> sorry it's a very <laughs> dull and horrible thing yeah. to say but assume the worst because you, you, your cash flow will be spikier than you think you'll you'll have higher peaks and lower troughs um uh that's not necessarily doing anything it's it's your your way of thinking has got to be pessimistic yeah and I, and I guess with that if you approach everything so pessimistically you can then start thinking differently about actually how do you take some of that uncertainty out of the equation because you're looking you you physically have to look the way you make your your business work because you're that pessimistic about everything you start reducing some of the uncertainty you start taking a slightly different approach to things and actually by result of that you're going to have probably a more realistic budget forecast which because the way you've been looking at it is probably going to make more sense anyway um to me that's it. it's a kind of getting your mind yeah. in the place of assume the worst and make decisions based on that you're going to have a more profitable sustainable business anyway just because of that way of looking at things would you agree yeah for sure i mean i've, got, I've worked with loads of startups and you know every month i've got one or two thinking how i'm going to make payroll at the end of the month you know it's that this this is my world and, and missing payroll is that's 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 death you don't pay your employees at the end of the month you've totally lost their confidence yep. just you cannot go there 
So, Phil, your, your top tip on cash flow management, if you're going to encourage any any business owner listening to this to do one thing um, to get better at cash flow management, what would you, what would you, what would you suggest they do? Um, without being too dull, I'll probably go a similar lines to Colin. I, I think that the main thing is having a plan and having a forecast around that plan and being pessimistic. I could add in adding a tool set in terms of using something that's going to basically have something to make it nice and easy for you to use. But that's that just makes it easier. I would say that, that the absolute critical thing is, is if you're constantly evaluating what your forecast is and what your plan is, well, then, you know, that's a skill. It's a great discipline to have, but it's also a very useful skill because, quite frankly, no one gets for a forecast, right? No one, you know, everyone's, you know, I'd like to say everyone tends to over, you know, uh, underplay it, but quite often people, uh, you know, well, significantly overplay it. But the challenge is, is if you're if you're constantly reviewing what your plan is, you've got a much better chance of being able to kind of uh, manage your cash flow because that's going to, you know, that's going to be at the heart of it. If you're not constantly evaluating and not burying your head in the sand, then you're more likely to be able to kind of assess where the problems are going to hit and when they're going to hit, which is, you know, it's critical. Great. No, thanks, Phil. I think think top advice there. So I mean, just one last final thing, because I feel we there's it's all very well being on the pessimist side of everything here, but you know, we've got to we we like to give some positivity to to businesses we work with and, and hopefully give some kind of sign that things will get easier or better. Um have you have you guys got any thoughts as to um with all the challenge we've got at the moment with all the rising prices and, and struggles on every aspect? Any any light at the end of the tunnel you're thinking, or any any words of wisdom to keep people positive? Well, I don't think it's that bad myself. You don't think so? Uh, but for, you know, for most business, well, for most businesses, you know, the fuel price probably isn't that relevant. Yeah. Um, wage inflation, yeah, that that's the hardest one, really. Um, but if your business can't accommodate giving employees a fairly decent pay rise, then you're probably looking at your business rather than at the employees' pay rises. Yeah. Um, but I mean, for me, there hasn't really been a downturn in in, in revenue. There's been an uptick in costs, for sure, but the uptick's not, it's not huge. It's not life-threatening. So, yeah, I mean, for me, it's kind of business as usual, really. It's not too bad. Okay. Well, that sounds good. Got it. Obviously, some of the companies you're working with are in a in a positive position. And Phil, any any positive thoughts you, you would share? Um, I think there's... Um... I think there are some, I'd, I'd say some of the businesses I work with uh, are seeing more of a squeeze than others. Um, some businesses are, you know, uh, I would say benefit from the current situation, but certainly aren't it seriously impacted. I think it really depends that some of the businesses that I work with are potentially, um, they're finding it difficult. I think there is uh, the, the positive side of the moment. It feels like that this is, um, you know, the current, you know, a lot of the current trends that are ongoing at the moment are not, you know uh, they're not they're not going to be they're not going to be as impactful as other people had previously previously indicated i think you know i think it's it, it really depends on the it's, it's so specific to the industry you're in at the moment so certainly in tech businesses at the moment you know there's there continues to be a lot of opportunity whereas in you know manufacturing other businesses it really depends as colin says if you can afford to be able to cover some of the uh, changes in the environment such as increases in wages then you know there may not be any impact at all if your business is facing those kind of squeeze points and you can't afford to to, to you know to increase wages or be able to cover your costs then it's a very different situation so yeah cool okay well look, thanks both for sharing that i think there is i i do think for, for it's not the same for every business there are some some opportunities to to improve um how businesses are and how they're feeling and all i would do is encourage people to talk to other people and talk to us and, and see how we might be able to add some value and help. Um, so look, um, Phil Colin, thanks so much for joining um, this podcast. Thanks for listening. If you'd like more information about the topics discussed in this podcast, then you can find us on our website at moveyourbusinessforward.com.